Welcome back to Secondhand Sellers, where we talk about all things thrifting, resale, and secondhand. I'm Clayton. And I'm Sarah. Thanks for joining us again this week. So, what are we talking about this week? We are going to talk about some sourcing strategies and maybe a little selling strategies that are kind of built into that because I think these two things are linked. How we source is directly linked to um, our values around, like, our selling values um, and what kind of profit margins we're looking at or um, how much we're putting, like it does have to do with profit margins, but just how much money we have invested into our inventory mm -hmm. and those kinds of things are related. And I think that does affect how we sell. Yeah. So really quick, when it comes to sourcing, you could go out and spend $50 and buy one item and sure that one item may sell for $80 online mm -hmm. but what you end up doing is un like you're not bringing home a lot of profit even though eBay is going to so show you made an $80 sale mm -hmm. so what are some of the ways that you kind of mitigate those high-end sales where you're having a better return versus a, an overall profit versus a you know, sale generator. Okay, so, <laughs> and, and like in using your example there, mm -hmm. you spent 50, you make 80. Mm -hmm. That's a $30 profit. Minus a few other that, things here and there. The some fees, fees, some things like that. eBay takes like 15%, I think is what we, as a general. Uh, it's 13.25 plus, plus anything else. So, yeah, and it depends on if you've got it promoted. Mm -hmm. We got some different fees built in. for the But for the sake of simplicity, you know, you have a thirty. Let's say it's a thirty dollar profit on this item. Yeah. Um, you could just as easily make a thirty dollar profit by buying two one dollar items that mm -hmm. you then sell for you know sixteen dollars or yeah. whatever. And so, obviously, there's more work that goes into two listings versus one, so that's a consideration. But and I have said this a billion times, but you buy buy cheaply mm -hmm. as much as you can. Now I have made exceptions to this. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I just showed you today, there was a Zojirushi, um Hello Kitty's like special rice cooker. And those of those of you that are familiar with uh, rice cooker brands, Zojirushi is a well-known Japanese brand of rice cookers. So the Japanese eat a lot of rice, so they make really great rice cookers. Um, and obviously it's got the Hello Kitty character. So I did pay more for that one, um, more in the $60 range. It was new with the box. Um, but your margin on that is going to be much higher. I'm hoping to come very close to doubling mm -hmm. that, but I don't know if I if it'll quite be double, but it'll be a decent margin. Yeah. But that is a real rarity. So for me, um, I source cheaply. That is the biggest thing. And I I know when you're getting into resale, it can be like, oh gosh, you got to pay so much. But there are a lot of hidden gems out there, mm -hmm. and and one of my strategies too is. Um, especially if you're going to places where maybe more aggressive resellers are, you're not wanting to interact with that crowd or be associated with that, like really aggressive, um, competitive uh, type of reseller, you can look for things that are more unusual. Mm -hmm. And I have found lots of things that are a little more unusual that some of those more aggressive sellers that are going for obvious resellable things like electronics or video games and we all know about lululemon and yeah. levi and ralph Polo, like all the name brand you skip all those right and it's not to say you can't pick those up if you come across them right but sometimes for instance i think you can see these these brass i think these are brass deer here i got these at the goodwill five bucks a piece mm -hmm. um they are up on the ebay right our ebay store right now and i'm hoping to do you know at least Obviously, I at least want to double, but I'm I'm hoping to do closer to um, three, you know, four times what I paid. Right. So about three times in profit, you know. So at least that's my goal for those. Um, but this is not something that a lot of resellers who are looking for the obvious quick flip of you know electronics or the mm -hmm. games or whatever, they're gonna look right over something like this. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of things out there, garage sales, estate sales, um, thrift stores that are those items. They're unique or they seem plain. Mm -hmm. Like I've talked about 
stemware and stuff that a lot of people just overlook because, oh, you know, whatever, a glass is a glass, you know, or a plate is a plate. And that's not necessarily true, especially if it's a special edition, if it's a holiday thing that could go in a set and complete someone's set, if they've, you know, broken a dish at last holiday, mm -hmm. if it's a, a good brand where the they're expensive new, so pe the resale value is also high, but it allows people to, to get them at a better deal. Right. Those kinds of things are sitting all over shelves everywhere and in garage sales. And I think going for those things are like a really big thing. Mm -hmm. What about you? Um, so one of the things I, I will do if I'm trying to mitigate some of my costs, mm -hmm. I will buy a lot or a collection of items. For example, recently I picked up on Facebook Marketplace a box that was full of Intellivision and Atari games. And he wanted 50 bucks for the whole box, which normally I probably wouldn't pay 50 bucks for a box of video games. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research though, and per item, I was paying like $3 each. So when you do that math, it was like, there's some decent profit to be made there. In all reality, I probably only be profiting probably 50, 60 bucks, somewhere around mm -hmm. there. But that's still a decent amount of profit in relation to... I'm doubling my money plus a little bit extra because of eBay fees and whatnot with that. But I got them all quickly mm -hmm. and they were easy for me to turn around and list and get and get um, portioned out so that way I can make a solid return. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if I were to only say, I want to find these video games at a good cost. And I'm going to scour around at different garage sales and whatnot. It's going to take me forever to get something equivalent to that. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes just by being able to be, take a little bit of extra time and part out something mm -hmm. like a collection, it can turn you into some good profit. It's not always going to. And you should do your research probably a little more than I did initially mm -hmm. when I bought mine. But you know, if you have some of that knowledge ahead of time, you may be able to find something that if you, by putting forth that effort, it will make you better profit than what you already put into it. So, mm -hmm. um, that's one of the ways, which sometimes when I go to garage sales, I'll grab multiple items and be like, these are all basically the same. Can we get you a little bit of a discount? So there's wiggle room with almost every scenario that mm -hmm. you can do. Exception being Goodwill, but it's Goodwill. So yeah, that's, take it or leave it. And uh -huh. I think also we've talked. I think I've mentioned this before. Don't be afraid to walk away mm -hmm. if the price is just not right. Yeah. Obviously, if it's if it's an independent seller like a garage sale, we talked about it again and again. Do not be rude. Mm -hmm. Do not be insulting in your offers. Anything like that. Um, just be prepared to walk away if it's just not a good enough deal. It's fine. You can sit there. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else can come pick it up. Or you can come back the following day and hope to get a better deal because they don't want to deal with yeah. it anymore. And so it's, it is a different <laughs> thing. I mean, even if you think about put you, putting yourself in that seller's position, mm -hmm. if you have a garage sale, you're going to be way less flexible on average the first hour of the first day than you are the last hour of the last day. Just because... You, you haven't had that traffic through there. Yeah. A good way to put it into perspective is your own eBay store. Sometimes mm -hmm. when I list items, I'll get offers like right away. And yeah. it's like, I you're not be, ready to move I, I yet. could respond to that and it might be a great offer. But sometimes it's like, I'm going to let that sit for 12 hours and see if anybody actually comes along and just buys it yep. at full price. Exactly. I'm similar. Yeah. But if you go into my eBay store and you find something that's been sitting there for six months, there's a good chance that I'll work with you on price yep. versus something that has just been there a day or two or a week or something. So go do that. I will work with you on price. Yeah. Um, but I think another thing to think about when you're sourcing mm -hmm. as part of your sourcing strategy is to not only uh, account for the price you're paying at the time, but the time it'll take to get the thing ready for mm -hmm. sale. So something like video games often are very easy, unless they're like really weirdly gross. Yeah. They're pretty easy to clean up and turn around. Um, you know, sometimes dishes or housewares, you can just wash up real quick. Mm -hmm. If it's something that's going to take an intense amount of cleaning mm -hmm. or repair, figure that into the cost. Mm -hmm. So if you get it for five bucks, it may not be a good deal if you have to spend a week repairing it. Right. 
And, but if you're going to turn it around for 20 or something like that. I, I have some um, golf bags. Mm -hmm. I, got the, I got them out of the trash completely free. I have not taken the time to clean them because when I did get them out of the trash, they were kind of gross because mm -hmm. they had been stored in someone's garage. They have still been sitting in my garage. Earn me nothing. Mm -hmm. But if I did eventually take the time to clean them, I know it's going to take me quite a bit of time to clean them because they're kind of, kind of nasty. So yeah. it's one of those things. Years of grime. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of those things, honestly, I probably should just take them and put them right back up to the curb. <laughs> but you can't let it go. But I got them for nothing. So it, it garage overall, sale. <laughs> it, garage sale. Be willing to kill your death pile, but you know. <laughs> That's a topic to, for another I'm video. I'm to myself. <laughs> be a great topic for a there video. There we go. Attacking yeah. the death pile. But anyway, um, I'd like to talk a little bit when we're talking about sourcing strategies, mm -hmm. or you could think of it as a sourcing philosophy. Um, I'll share a little bit about where we have been moving with that. Now that we are, we're not quite a year in yet. We April will be a year that we since we started our eBay. And our or I do most of the sourcing. I think I've talked about this before. Hannah does do do it with me sometimes, but her schedule is more restrictive, so I do a lot of it. Um, and I enjoy thrifting and, and estate selling and everything. But my strategy has changed a little bit over time. Mm -hmm. So in these past few months, we almost, we don't have 300 things listed, active listings on eBay right yet, but we're between 250 and 300 right now. So now that we've got a good backlog of things, and a decent little inventory going, um, I have started moving towards sourcing things that are going to automatically be a higher return. Mm. So I'm pass bypassing things that are more often, that are in that maybe 10 to $15 range and focusing on profit ranges uh, upwards of 20. Mm. And, and real realistically, lately, it's even looked a little higher, maybe upwards of 30. Um, just because we don't, I would rather, it's a sort of like work harder, not smarter thing. And I know there's a variety of resellers that do things differently. Some people sell lots of low value items and some of us sell, there's some resellers that sell a lot of high value items. And I think you see this like in the antiques trade. Antique deal dealers tend to sell a lot of high value items. They'll have a few like bread and butter low things. But for the most part, if you walk into an antique store, it's going to be the higher end prices. Yeah. And so we've been moving towards that um, higher margin item or trying to move towards that with a, maybe a few exceptions of like going to the bins or something where you're going to pick up little things and yeah. it just is how it is. Um, but that was already your target niche that you wanted to go into as it was. A little bit, but we there's still a lot of things in the vintage realm mm -hmm. and even antique realm, you know, books and tchotchkes and little housewares that that are lower value items um and you you'll see this a lot like at a vintage mall like where there's a lot of little like housewares or, mm -hmm. and that's fine and if we we eventually want to have a physical space i think we've talked about that on here we've definitely talked about that with you mm -hmm. personally um and if we get into a physical location we definitely will up the sourcing on that because right. you can sell something for five dollars at a you know, when someone's walking around a mall in a way that it's just not worth it to me personally. And it's fine if, if you're into that, that's cool. But for me personally, I would rather not deal in five to ten dollar items very much on eBay. Yeah. Just because of your time of taking pictures. Oh, cleaning it, mm -hmm. taking pictures. Then well, and you packing think, it and well and you think too, not not only time, because that mm -hmm. is time is money. Yeah. But it, there's also increased costs in packaging mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, tape. Yeah. So I, I'll, we get a lot of our packaging for free. It's reused. Hannah picks it up at work. Um, she works at a, a retail location that gets a lot of boxes, so yeah. things that would be going to dump anyway. Um, but we still have to pay for packing tape, and we have bought some packing materials like bubble wrap and things. And so if you're sending out, if you, let's, like the for instance, um, some of our examples from earlier, if you're sending out two things to make $50 versus sending out one thing to make $50, um, the costs involved with that, including time and including packaging are lower, but your margin's exactly the same. Yeah. 
And so we've been kind of moving towards that, that philosophy of a little bit higher items. Um, and maybe we don't sell as many things in the same time frame, but you know, hopefully our, our ideally our profits will be the same or higher. Um, what is your philosophy on this? Um, so I kind of put a limit of, I try not to list anything under 10 bucks. Okay. Just because anything under 10, by the time eBay fees and all that, yeah, you've made nothing my time. for hours. I don't intentionally source items that are going to sell for under 10 bucks, mm -hmm. unless it's like, I'm paying a dollar for this or paying 50 cents and it definitely is going to sell for $10. And I know it's going to sell for $10. Mm -hmm. I might get it. But I'm not going to go out there and intentionally find it. I'd rather, like you said, I really like that $15, $20 range. Mm -hmm. And to me, I'd rather sell like a few items that are $15, $20. Bucks, and I know I'm putting money in my pocket mm -hmm. quickly versus getting one item that may sell for $50. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to sit on it a little longer just because for me having those consistent sales mm -hmm. builds up my cash flow a little bit better that's just my own personal no and i do it, like that 20 to the 20 to 50 is the sweet spot if you uh, get over 50 15 that's to, awesome 15 you know? to 20 is what i'm talking about mm -hmm. the, the like, 15 to 20. like because more people are willing to spend 20 dollars on a consistent basis and so i see more of my sales 15 to 20 bucks mm -hmm. i have so many sales right in that range anything higher than that uh, it, it might sit a little longer mm -hmm. like for example i had a guitar hero controller i was not able to test it so i sold it for parts i listed it i think it was like 28 bucks is what i listed it for that's above that 20 to 20 dollar range and it sat on ebay for like 10 days mm -hmm. as soon as i sent an offer to somebody for 25 they took it mm -hmm. Cool, it moved. Versus during that time, that same time frame, I probably sold 10 or 12 items that were 10 to 15 bucks, mm -hmm. or 10 to 20 bucks. That 15 to 20 dollars, mm -hmm. <laughs> just because um, more people are willing to go, ah, I'll spend 20 bucks. Yeah. And to me, getting more of those consistent sales, it, it I think that just helps my store overall. Mm -hmm. But and we do like we said like this is a ideal mm -hmm. scenario so i i try to price my things to where i have wiggle room built in so if i do get a watcher i don't mind sending mm -hmm. you know to try to maybe encourage them to buy um but i like i said we already have a couple hundred over 200 things on there yeah. we do have a lot of things that are under that 20 to 25 dollar range it's like that would be in that 10 to 20 dollar range mm -hmm. we have a few things that are even lower than that from previous so for this time we have i'm stepping back from sourcing a lot of lower things i think part of it too the difference in our strategies here mm -hmm. is that we also on and other elements of our sourcing strategy is different mm -hmm. i think i tend to do more research mm -hmm. while i'm actually sourcing uh, besides things that i think oh that's cool and i'm sure it'll be fine um Whereas I feel like you are like, it's cheap. I'm going to get it. Yeah. Sometimes. You know? And so just because like I'll go to a garage sale and if I'm finding stuff that's like, I know that will sell. I, I really like to gamble those one in two dollars. Do. So and it's I like, okay, I'll, I'll gamble. <laughs> I think I'm more likely to buy something for five dollars that I'm like, yeah, that is really cool and it's mm -hmm. going to sell or really desirable and it's going to sell. than I am to like spend five dollars on five things that I, you know, like I have no idea. Yeah. So I think that that is part of that. Yeah. Um, and I might see my strategy change over time if we start, you know, selling a lot of things and our, our inventory goes down and we just need some like sort of bread and butter, like filler. Yeah. You know, um, but I do try to keep my prices flexible too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't have like, I have an eye, like for these deer, for instance, I spent, yeah. I have about $10 in it, a little more than that. Um, and I have an ideal price, mm -hmm. which would be my listing price. And then I've got a wiggle range. Yeah. And then I have what I will sell it for six months from like now the floor when price. it's sitting there. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So those, those are a different, those are different things. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, ideally you'd at least double your money, but if you double your money on a $5 item, it's different than double, doubling your money on a $20 item. You know right, what I mean? So right. I think there's a lot of things that go into it. Um, do you have any other like sourcing strategies that you can think of? Um, so one of the big things is I, as I'm listing items, I watch other YouTubers as mm -hmm. they go out sourcing because I don't know everything. I don't know most of the stuff that I pick up because, you know, I don't have a brain for what everybody is going to be interested in. Mm -hmm. So I'm just passively. I like to watch and listen to stuff as I'm working on listing my own items. There have been times I'm watching other people's videos and I go, oh, wow, didn't know that. And then within the next couple of weeks, I'm out and about and I end up seeing whatever it was that they picked up and said, you know. this is good money. And so it just boils down to, you know, the more you learn about and the more you learn about consistent, profitable items, mm -hmm. the more your store is going to profit. I think overall. I mean, like many things in life, being a learner mm -hmm. and, and willing to learn and acknowledging that you don't know everything is going to help you yeah. in this business. Because there are so many physical objects in this world that it's impossible to know everything. Yeah. And just in this less than, less than a year, nine months, eight, ten months, whatever we're at, um, I've learned about products I never knew, brands I never mm -hmm. knew about. I still... The candle you picked up for like four dollars or whatever it was and it was a sixty dollar oh, candle. Was, yeah. <laughs> it, was just like, it was like eight or nine bucks and it was yeah. like a eighty eight or fifty dollars or eighty eight uh -huh. something. I was insane. And it's but, just like you, you never would have known. You would have walked right past it normally. No, and because, I had an idea that like these things existed. Yeah. And it was at the case of the Salvation Army uh -huh. and then I looked at the brand and went, Yeah. Okay. Yep. I mean I ended up keeping that one, but so there's the, a lot of things like that. There's just so many items that passively, if you just kind of hear about it, or you know, it, taking in some knowledge is going to help you in the long run with this business, no matter what you do. And hopefully that's why you're listening to the podcast, just because there's a lot to learn. There is. <laughs> and I think too, like brands, for instance, mm -hmm. um, just how you grew up can influence what brands you are familiar with. Yeah. And what ones you've never heard of. And so I think I think that's also a valuable part of, for instance, going to estate sales. Mm -hmm. Is you really get to see a wide range of homes, of socioeconomic statuses, mm -hmm. of brands. And you can see what high value brands are mm -hmm. versus something that's more normal and, you know, you, every day. Yeah. So um, do you have any other tips or tricks for sourcing strategy or your own sourcing philosophy? Anything else to say about that? Oh, uh, not not in particular. How about you? Um, no, I think, but I think it's a good thing to think about. Mm -hmm. Like, as you're, some of you are resellers, some of you may be interested in the idea of being res resellers. And I think maybe reflecting on what your sourcing strategy and your sourcing philosophy um, can help you work on your business. Mm -hmm. Um because like I said, like my goals are maybe different than yours. Sometimes they're similar. Um, we might spend similar amounts of money on sourcing, but I may get less and you may have volume, you know? So just, do you like the volume? Do you like waiting around a little longer? And, and it also boils down to the different amount of time. Because mm -hmm. like you may spend, you know, 10 minutes working on one item mm -hmm. that you're staging, you're making it better improving and you're going to make more profit and that goes back to our previous episode if you haven't listened to staging your items for photos but and then i might be listing four items to earn the same amount of profit mm -hmm. but how much time do you have to invest it it all boils down to how much effort and time do you want to put into it along with the money so mm -hmm. and if this is a, a serious side gig like it might make more sense for you to get higher margin items mm -hmm. fewer higher margin items just because you cannot handle having a lot of stock yeah. or if you have a small area you live in an apartment or something and you don't have the space for volume that might be a burden to you to have a lot of small items when you could just sell fewer mm -hmm. larger or larger value items i should say so I think there's a lot of things, lifestyle, business goals, personality mm -hmm. plays into all of that. 
Um, like you said, you like gambling your one and two dollar bills. I'm less likely to do that. I'm more likely to gamble a dollar than in five, but you know, those kinds of things all go into your outlook yeah. on, on sourcing. And I, another thing that I do, um, too, is if it's like I talk about picking up unique things, if something's interesting or catches my eye, I'll flip it over to just look at the, the label, mm -hmm. see if there's a brand, see if there's anything interesting or anything to it. And I think I've talked about that before. So there's a lot of things that go into that. We would love to hear um, your sourcing strategies. Are you a high margin kind of person? You like you sell fewer things, but at higher value? Or are you a volume type of person? Um, I think all of these and everything in between um, exist in, in reselling. And I think I was probably more in the in-between early on. And I'm, I'm so slowly transitioning. transitioning. <laughs> yeah, I'm in a time of transition. And part of that was um, we spent January not sourcing and we were trying to catch up on our backlog. Mm. And so now that we're at that state, then going forward, I can be more thoughtful. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for joining us again this week. Um, we will be back next week with another episode. And hopefully we'll also have some um, special bonus content up on the YouTube channel. Uh, we'll, we'll not be in the audio format only, but it will definitely be up on the YouTube channel mm -hmm. in the coming weeks. So watch out for those. Uh, hopefully some thrift hauls and things. Yeah, hopefully. Those are always fun. It all depends on what we can do with our time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for joining us. Until next time. Bye. Yeah.